Now what I want to do is go back to the, the D part of the model, our functional, emotional, developmental capacities, and walk you through our functional, emotional, developmental milestones. And uh, no, we're not going to, uh, uh, excuse me, when I, I'll, I'll show the slides a little bit later. So I appreciate you trying to keep up with me with the slides. But what I'm going to do is show them all later as a summary. Uh, so we don't need the slides now. So if we can take this, the uh, PowerPoint off, uh, I'll just talk and, and uh, walk you through this. And then later on, we're going to uh, go through this uh, in a summary way, and I'll show you the, the PowerPoint. But I don't want to distract you. I want to get you involved in back and forth emotional signaling with me. <laughs> so I don't want this memorized, I want it experienced. <laughs> the, so when we look at our functional emotional developmental capacities, I mentioned before that the reason why we call them functional emotional is because of the central role of affect or emotion. That becomes the team leader. So let me walk you through all these different levels and show you how we believe it occurs during human development. Uh, and the way it occurs during development, as I'll show you later, is also the way we think it occurred during human evolution starting with, with uh, pre-human uh, or non-human primates, always up through modern human beings. And I'll show you some of our interesting research that we uh, just published in a book called The First Idea, how symbols, language, and intelligence evolved from our primate ancestors to modern humans, uh, showing that the same pattern that a baby goes through was the same pattern we went through during human evolution, to learn to be thinkers. Uh, but it begins with the first stage where we talk about regulation and interest in the world. And here, picture a newborn baby or a four-year-old that we're working with trying to harness their interest in the world. Uh, how does that occur? How does that newborn baby learn to turn their head to look towards mommy to the left or look towards daddy to the right? Uh, how do they begin taking an interest in the world? And how do they begin calming down and regulating themselves? Well, what's interesting is the baby can see based on what they're born with. The baby can begin some movement. You'll see babies moving in utero. And as soon as the baby is born, there'll be some basic movements. But in order for the baby to develop the beginning of purposeful movement, moving towards mommy's face, turning towards daddy's voice to take a purposeful interest in the world, we need one more element. And that's our old friend, affect or emotion. A baby will turn towards a pleasurable voice, but if it's aversive and that baby is sensitive to sound and the voice is too high pitched, the baby won't look. The baby may, in fact, look away. So very early in life, it's not simply a sensory motor pattern in the first days and weeks of life. It's a sensory affect motor pattern, which we call an SAM. And the affect links the perception, the sensation coming in, what you see or what you hear, with the coordinated motor pattern, like looking. So we see a few uh, basic patterns early in life. We see a lot of rhythmic movement together, where the baby and the mommy or the daddy or the other caregivers are moving their arms, and the baby is not even making sounds yet, but in rhythm with mommy's voice. And when we did do slow motion videos of babies and mommies, we can see, see the synchrony occurring in the interaction pattern. And we see the beginning of these purposeful patterns, like turning and looking. Uh, these are both mediated by affect. If the pleasurable affect is not there, if the baby is not being comforted or being regulated, uh, we don't see the synchrony, and we don't see the purposeful looking or listening. 
So the SAM, the sensory affect motor pattern, is critical at this first, first stage as the system is getting, getting organized. And while we don't have brain imaging studies on human babies at this age, from animal studies, it appears that these early interactive patterns and the early role of affect is critical for helping the brain lay down its early pathways. The human baby comes into the world only with certain basic neurological equipment in place, as different from other animals who come in with a more developed nervous system. So the human baby depends on experience for most of its brain growth, which occurs after birth. So the baby can, at birth, recognize patterns, can see, can hear, can move. But for these basic capacities to recognize patterns, to see, to move, to learn, to become organized at higher levels is experience-based. And without these experiences, neither the mind nor the brain appear to develop. So we have adequate and horrifying uh, natural situations where we've seen babies in orphanages who don't receive the necessary nurturing, pleasurable, regulating, soothing, loving experiences who fail to develop their language or their social skills. Uh, we also see babies at biological risk who, because of biological challenges, have a hard time with those early experiences and who also then don't develop the optimal levels of language, cognitive, social, or emotional skills. So when this pathway gets derailed for environmental reasons or biological reasons, we don't see healthy brain or, mental or mind development. Uh, and from animal experiments, uh, when an animal is provided rich experiences, uh, there's more neuronal connections in that area of the brain through which those experiences are provided, like more sound experiences with an animal will provide more dendritic connections in the areas of the brain having to do with sound perception. And visual, the same, the same things happen. So there is, seems to be mounting evidence for experience-based learning. Uh, and not just the level of the mind, but the level of the brain also in terms of interconnecting pathways. So we can reason that that early affect connection is very important for this first stage and for setting the agenda for healthy mental and brain functioning as it's beginning to evolve. Now, the second stage we call engagement or falling in love. So from about two to four months, we see the baby moving beyond simply rhythmic, regulated activity and interest in the world generally. And now the baby seems to take a special interest in the human world with pleasure and delight. And we see that most noticeably with the beatific warm smile. <sighs> so typically, four-month-old caregiver and baby interacting big warm smiles, synchronous vocalization, synchronous arm movements. <coughs> and we see that the relationship is really getting cooking. And what's happening emotionally is there's a broadening of the emotional range. There's not just pleasure and delight. There's also protests and curiosity beginning to emerge and excitement and the baby's ability to modulate excitement. And we see that the mother or the father or the other caregivers in the baby are working together towards up and down regulating that excitement and that pleasure and that joy and that anger and that curiosity and the range of emotions that are part of that emerging engagement pattern, that emerging attachment, that emerging relationship. So here we're seeing, again, a second stage of functional emotional development or of mental development and of brain development. And again, while we can't look inside the brain in human uh, babies we, because doing this, those kinds of studies uh, would, not, would, would put babies at risk, uh, we can imagine 
that those parts of the central nervous system from our, again, animal studies that have to do with engagement and affiliation and attachment are beginning to get myelinated and connected. Now, then we go to our third stage of two-way purposeful interaction. This is the stage I was talking about before when I was giving the examples of reciprocal back and forth social interaction. So between three months and about eight, nine months, the baby goes beyond simply engaging with the caregiver and enjoying the caregiver and getting involved in this rhythmic interaction and expanding their emotional range. And now the baby becomes a two-way purposeful communicator. The baby is learning cause and effect. Their smile leads to a smile. Their frown leads to a, to a frown. They're learning social reciprocity. They're learning to res respond to as well as comprehend emotional signals of others. And also they're learning to differentiate, to separate and distinguish their own emotions and their own sounds because each one is getting a different response back. So the baby learns the difference between happiness and anger, not just because it feels different, but each one gets a different facial expression and a different sound back from the, the mommy or the daddy. So when we think about a 12-year-old who can't read and respond to social signals, you can't teach that in a social group with memorized rules. If you do that, you dig the hole deeper. If you say to that 12-year-old, every time you come to a new person, say hello and stick your hand out and shake their hand. That is going to dig the hole deeper. That's like asking you to work a cocktail party uh, uh, with a series of rules. I'd have to give you about six billion rules. You know, what to do when the person uh, doesn't like your joke, what to do when the person likes your joke, what to do when the person is competitive with you, what to do when the person is, uh, is nice to you, et cetera. There are too many rules. Can't learn it that way. A human being uh, is smarter than that. So the way that's learned is going back to that eight-month period where you learn to read and respond to social signals. So when I want to teach a 12-year-old how to read and respond to social signals, what I do is get that 12-year-old involved in a relationship where somebody is very animated with that 12-year-old. And when that 12-year-old is responding, you know, with delight or happiness, we're a little bit more like we're responding to a much younger child. <gasps> wow, isn't that exciting? Yes, it is. Oh, I can see you're angry. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're very animated back. And then we try to have lots of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, but spontaneous peer-to-peer -peer interaction. You have gotta log the hours, and the system does develop, even at older ages, if you give the experience. Uh, but you can't do it with rote learning. The, so that's our third stage, two-way purposeful communication. And as I mentioned before, it gives birth to a lot of important cognitive language, perceptual motor, uh, and sensory processing experiences. Also, interestingly, as two-way communication is coming in, we all worry about children, particularly on the autistic spectrum, regulating themselves. Uh, the best regulator a child has is to regulate themselves off of interactions with another human being. So as a baby becomes a two-way communicator, the baby is learning self-regulation. Because as the baby begins getting annoyed, as an eight or nine or 10-month-old begins going, Arr! In the old days, the baby would just bite or go into a full tantrum. Now as the baby is going, Arr! mommy or daddy or the caregiver, or for an older child, the therapist or the educator might go, oh, what's the matter? Do you want this? Do you want that? Hold two things up. So rather than the baby or the older child going over the top and having a meltdown, we now have emotional signaling to negotiate that child's need. And the child is learning to become an emotional signaler, negotiating the anger. So the parent of the eight-month-old and nine-month-old is holding up, do you want this? And the baby goes, ah, this, ah, okay. 
Now, so we're getting negotiation and interaction instead of a meltdown. So the child around this third stage is going through an important transformation, and we call each of these stages uh, emotional transformations, where the emotions actually change. Uh, the child is going through an important transformation where the child goes from being under the pressure of catastrophic emotions, all or nothing kind of feelings, fight flight reactions or shutdown reactions, which we see in older children who have challenges where the child either loses it and attacks, withdraws, or just shuts down and becomes immobilized, or runs away or becomes aimless. Those are catastrophic reactions. And we see those reactions, which are part of normal early infancy, give way to co-regulated emotional signaling and negotiation, beginning at around eight, nine months, and then building up into the fourth stage. So, that's, so now the baby can start regulating themselves. When they're excited, mommy can down-regulate with a little more of a soothing voice. When the baby is getting self-absorbed and getting lost in their own self, you can upregulate with a little more energy. Huh, look at this, look at that. So regulation is a product of two-way affective signaling. That's our best regulator. Eventually, when we get older, we learn to regulate ourselves by having taken in this experience. So we talk ourselves down. We're starting to get excited, and we have this little voice in our mind saying, calm down. Come. You're overreacting. <laughs> You don't need to yell and scream. <laughs> okay? But that's the better we were co regulated as children, the more likely we can talk ourselves down as, as adults. So this starts in this third, third stage. And then that leads to a fourth stage, which we call shared social problem solving and the emergence of a sense of self. And now, from about nine months to 18 months, the toddler is learning to have a continuous flow of back and forth emotional gesturing. The toddler is learning to literally have 50, 60, 70 of what we call circles of communication in a row. And I'll come back to that term of circles of communication, but what we mean is uh, the child does something like looks, and the parent goes, oh, what do you want, and holds something up. And then if the child reaches for it, the child has closed the circle of communication because the child or the baby now is building on what the parent did or said. So the key on a circle of communication is, is the infant or toddler or older child closing the circle of communication? A lot of children open the circle by pointing or reaching or looking or making a sound or doing something. We do something responsive to it, but then does the child close the circle? So typically we'll see with a child with an autistic spectrum disorder at age three, they may uh, take a toy and bang it, and we may say, oh, can I see that? And the child will just drop the toy, turn away, and walk to something else. They haven't closed the circle of communication. And at this level four, shared social problem solving, we not only want to see a few circles of communication like we did at level three, where we got, let's say, five or 10 circles of communication, exchanging sounds. Now we want to see 50 plus circles of communication in a row. So we want to see a pattern in healthy development where the little 15, 16-month-old toddler takes mommy by the hand, walks to the toy area, points to the toy up there, gestures, pick me up. Daddy or mommy picks up little Susie or Johnny. Uh, they reach for the toy, give mommy or daddy a big hug and a smile, and nod uh, glowingly and thankfully. Okay, now we have, in that interaction, we have many circles of communication in a row because there were all kinds of head nods and vocalizations and gestures mediating each one of these steps. And I mentioned about six or seven steps, and there were probably 
five or six sub-steps in each of these, so he probably had 40 circles in that little interaction. And you'll see that in healthy adaptive development, you'll see that typically happening. Uh, you won't even think of it as circles of communication. You just see it as a child who's, quote, organized and purposeful and seems to be aware of his, his or her world, seems to be socially responsive. We use broad terms like that, but really what's happening, if you look at it microscopically, you're getting 50 plus circles of communication. Now why that's so important is that is missing in most of the kids who get diagnosed with an autistic spectrum disorder and in many other special needs conditions. Uh, children with severe language problems often have weaknesses in what I call the continuous flow of back and forth communication. Children with severe regulatory problems who are inattentive or attentional problems often have weaknesses in this system. But when we did a um, review of 200 cases, which I'll show you later, of children with autistic spectrum disorders, even those children who were diagnosed at older ages, ages three and four, and even those children who had regression later at age 18 months or two years of age, who had a lot of language already, who were looking at picture books and labeling pictures and were counting and were repeating the alphabet so that everyone was confident little Johnny and Susie was doing well and then had a regression at age 18 months or two years. In almost every instance, when I asked the question about continuous flow of back and forth interaction, the children had not mastered this fourth level. It was the clue that there was a vulnerability there. Now, in all likelihood where there's a clear regression, there's then a stress at that later age where the regression occurs because a vulnerability doesn't necessarily make for a regression itself. There needs to be a second kind of stress. And for some kids, it may have been uh, something physical. And there's a lot of speculation about uh, toxic chemicals and all kinds of other stresses physically or illnesses that can bring on a, a regression. We know in other, other disorders, like juvenile diabetes, for example, uh, a virus is thought to bring on the diabetes in a genetically vulnerable child. So at age three, when the child develops diabetes, uh, it appears that there was a genetic vulnerability and then the protein in a particular virus that's alleged now may precipitate the autoimmune reaction where the islet cells of the child are knocked out and don't produce insulin and the child develops frank diabetes. So often you have a stress and the stress may not be uh, a toxic chemical always, it could be a, a virus, it could be another kind of illness. Some kids uh, develop allergic reactions to strep bacteria. So this is an area that's fruitful for more research, but uh, the key point here I want to make is that regardless of what causes the regression later, there appears to be a vulnerability in this fourth level in most of the kids who develop autistic spectrum disorders. And it's something we can be mindful of in preventively work by particularly in siblings of children with autistic spectrum disorder, that if we strengthen this fourth level, I think we would reduce the likelihood of a later stress causing a regression. And you might get a stress causing dysregulation or behavioral problems or attentional problems, but not a profound loss of relatedness and language uh, like we see with, with autism. So this level four is very, very, very important. Now what's happening during this stage is the child is not simply learning to open and close 50 plus circles of communication in a row, getting into this continuous flow, which is also the first thing we often work on with children with autism because it's, again, a missing piece and it's a foundation for everything else, but the sense of self is forming. How does a child form a sense of who they are as a person? Well, the sense of self is forming. Uh, the sense of self is forming because the child is now interacting in a very complex way and they're getting feedback in an ongoing way from the environment. So the child is learning what love is about. Love is 
hugging and cuddling mommy. Love is being mischievous and getting a, a dirty look back. Love is being made to feel safe when I'm about to get my hand stuck in the dishwasher. Love is many things. So the child is now through 50 plus circles of back and forth interaction learning to operate in terms of patterns, not just isolated behaviors. And these patterns, the patterns having to do with love, the patterns having to do with discipline, the patterns having to do with curiosity, okay, these major patterns become how I define me. I am, the me is the product of my different interactive patterns, loving patterns, mischievous patterns, angry patterns, fearful patterns, right? That defines me. My expectations of the world, my picture of others is also made up of these patterns. Daddy comes home and he is usually grumpy and I could better stay away from him. Mommy comes home and she's playful and gets on the floor and gives me hugs and kisses. So I better gravitate to her. With daddy, I better wait a few minutes. Mommy, I'll jump on her lap. So the child learns to expect different things in different families. When a child hides behind the legs of the parent when Aunt Tilly comes over and runs up and embraces Aunt uh, Jessica, uh, that's not by chance. The child is not just simply trying to embarrass the parent. The child experiences a different pattern with each of these relatives and has different expectations. So that sense of self and the sense of others is beginning to form. In fact, the child is learning in this fourth stage the concepts that will define the language that the child is yet to learn in terms of words or symbols. So the child is understanding what love is, what discipline is, what anger is, what fear is, right? The child is even learning what an apple is. An apple has, is not just red and round, it has a certain taste, it feels a certain way when you throw it at your sibling, <laughs> etc. So the child is learning all about his world and then when words come in, the words are simply a shorthand label for what the child already knows. And this knowing is on a rapid learning curve between 9, 10 months and about 24 months in this what still is largely a pre-verbal stage with just emerging words because words themselves don't take off until our fifth level. But imagine what happens if this fourth level is not occurring. This knowing about the world, this understanding about the world is not happening. So let's say we try to teach a child of age four who's missed out on this fourth level, who's just been capable of one or two or three circles of communication, hasn't experienced the patterns, hasn't gotten the knowing about their world. So at age four, we try to teach them words. By definition, these words will have to be scripted. They'll be memorized dictionary definitions. An apple will simply be something that's round and red. Love will simply be something that when I give mommy a kiss. It won't be a deep, full understanding that love is discipline and compassion and empathy and caring and pleasure and excitement, right? So when we're working with a four-year-old, doesn't mean we don't work on new words, but it means we have to be working on level four and level three at the same time to build up the experiential basis to give those words meaning. So we do both at the same time, but we can't just work on the higher levels of the house and not get that foundation in place, particularly level, level four. Now also at level four, as I mentioned level three, the child is learning to be a better regulator. Now co-regulated emotional interactions really help the child learn to internalize his limits, learn to help the child learn to be focused and attentive. Because when you think about what attention is, the ability to focus, 
It's based on the ability to sequence many actions in a row in a problem-solving manner, right? That's a functional definition of attention. It's not simply the ability to stare off at an object for 10 minutes. And that comes from 50 or 60 circles in a row that are purposeful and goal-directed and part of pattern recognition. Now, one other very critical thing happens at this stage. And this is something we write about in our new book, The First Idea. And in fact, it's the core, uh, it's the core thesis of The First Idea, which is during this fourth stage, the child forms the ability to create symbols, to have a symbolic world. Now, a symbolic world is more than the world of just language and words. A symbolic world means we have mental images that are multisensory images. They're images of sight, they're images of sound, they're images of relationships. And we can use those images or those representations that are formally called symbols to think, right? We can compare them. We can use them to anticipate. Now, how does a child make the leap from simply acting on the world, simply doing to the world, grabbing, showing, pulling you around, to using symbols so that they can actually picture in their mind, again, this is not just a visual picture, but a multi-sensory picture, but picture actions in advance, picture relationships in advance. How does a baby make that leap? How did we make that leap in human evolution? Why was it, you know, when we look at these cave drawings 40, 30, anywhere between 25 and 50,000 years ago, uh, we see beginning drawings where we think symbols were uh, clearly in evidence in early, early humans. And we think that, that the modern humans came in and around somewhere between uh, 80,000 and 200,000 years ago. Uh, what enabled modern humans to become symbol users? What enables humans to have higher levels of symbol use than other animals? We know that bonobo chimps can do some symbolization. They can have some symbol use, but not to the degree that humans can. So what is the critical link that enables that jump from action, which we see in all members of the animal species, uh, animal kingdom, all the species, to some non-human primates and humans to, to create symbols? Well, here's, here's the theory. And I urge you all to read the first idea because it's, it, it sets us out in great, in great detail. Is that, you remember early on I mentioned that the child is at the mercy of catastrophic affects. Fight, flight reactions, all or nothing, shut down reactions. So early on in infancy, a baby is locked into what we might call fixed perceptual motor patterns. The baby sees and does, and it's fixed. So the baby, the very little baby, sees mommy and is hungry and starts crying, or gets angry and tries to scratch or bite. So the reaction is fixed. This perception, the sensation coming in, elicits a certain fixed motor response. Now we certainly see this in many members of the animal kingdom, right? There's a almost a fixed predictable reaction. Now, as a baby becomes able to signal with their emotions, they transform their emotions from a fixed catastrophic level to a signaling level. Now the affects become used for back and forth signaling. And by the fourth stage, we get 50 or 60 plus circles of signaling and problem solving. So anger is negotiated, love is negotiated, right? Now, as the baby is signaling, what happens to this fixed perceptual motor pattern? The baby or the toddler is no longer at the mercy of a fixed pattern. Now, anger doesn't lead automatically to biting or scratching, right? 
there's now a distance between the feeling and the pattern. There's now emotional signaling. So perceptions, what you see, and actions, what you do, now are separated. We no longer have fixed perceptual motor patterns. We now have, in place of that, problem solving. You see something, and you negotiate with your environment, your mom or your daddy, to solve a problem. How to get the food? How do I get the toy? I just don't have a meltdown. Now, under pressure, we all regress back to those fixed patterns. All right. Now, when you separate, this is the neat part. I know you're kind of waiting, waiting for the uh, climax of this. So, <laughs> okay. Here's the neat part. When you separate the perception from the action, you then have a freestanding perception. You can see mommy, and she's not just associated with grabbing or crying or hugging. So you have a picture of mommy that's freestanding. What is a freestanding perception? What might be another word for it? A symbol, or it's an image, right? It's an image. Or, or now, so you, now you have an image of mommy that's freestanding, not associated with fixed actions. That image of mommy is now exists as a multi-sensory picture in your, in your mind, not, no, not just, again, of, of visual, but of sound, of smell, of texture, et cetera. That image now can acquire meaning through many interactions with mother. So now we can associate to that picture of mother, mother hugging, mother setting limits, mother protecting us, making us feel safe, mother exciting us with play, right? Mother frustrating us by making us wait. So all these experiences and millions more now become associated with this picture of mother. That is the birth of a true symbol. Because a true symbol is not just an image or a picture in your mind, but it's a meaningful picture. So when we have a symbol for the word apple, it's not just red and round. It's a picture of an apple that tastes a certain way, that feels a certain way when you throw it, et cetera, et cetera. So the ability to create symbols occurs because we separate perceptions from actions through this fourth level of emotional transformation involving emotional signaling that has 50 plus circles in a row. And this gives birth to the symbolic world. Now, obviously, from a biological point of view, you have to have the capacity for pattern recognition and for engaging in many back and forth circles. But from an experiential point of view, you have to progress through these first three stages to the fourth stage and master the fourth stage experientially to get to true symbol formation. So it's not surprising, again, that children in orphanages wouldn't have this. We saw children in multi-problem families not master this. Children at biological risk who have interferences in their ability to master these first four stages often don't get to true symbol formation or not as full or rich. This is not necessarily an all or nothing. It can be partial. Now, here's the real neat part of this, is that when this appears to be blocked for biological reasons, like children at genetic risk for autism. The blockage does not appear to be total or complete. In other words, the main highways may be blocked, but the side pathways appear to still be open. So what we've seen is the degree to which we can get these first four levels cooking by working with the child's nervous system, being extra energizing to the underreactive child, being extra soothing to the overreactive child, you know, providing more visual support for the child with auditory processing problems. The more we can work with the individual differences in the nervous system and help the child master each of their functional, emotional, developmental levels, the more we can develop these side pathways and the children can develop symbols and develop meaningful language, not just scripted language. So the biological risk we see in many of the children, 
And it varies because some of the children have more neurologic problems than others. But for the vast majority of children, uh, this model that I'm sharing with you is an optimistic model because we can if we can find a way to master these four levels, we can find a pathway to symbol formation and to meaningful use of language and meaningful thinking and problem solving. And that becomes the key, and that's the key to our intervention approach, which you'll hear about in more detail tomorrow. So that's why this is a very, very important uh, component of this model, and the level four is so critical, because at this level four is where we open the door to symbol formation. Not at the higher levels when we're working on language per se. We've got to help the child become a continuous flow interactor with their environments so they can separate perceptions from actions, form freestanding images, invest those images with emotional meaning, and therefore create meaningful symbols. So it's a very experientially based, biology plays a role, but biology appears to be flexible, so even when there are biological impediments, genetic or otherwise, we often have side pathways we can use. So when working this way with children with Down syndrome and fetal alcohol syndrome uh, and other clear biological syndromes, severe forms of cerebral palsy, we're seeing more progress than we ever expected before working in this way. And we're certain see, certainly seeing more progress, as I'll show you tomorrow and later today, with children with autistic spectrum disorders, you know, working in this way, working from the bottom up, working on mastering these early levels. Now, the fifth level uh, has to do with the creation of ideas. Here, once we've opened the door to symbol formation, we begin seeing at the fifth level the child beginning to use symbols in pretend play. The dolls are hugging or kissing. And in the meaningful, not the scripted use of language, me hungry, mommy, love you, uh, give me a hug, I want an apple, juice now, as opposed to just repeating things from a book or repeating TV shows. So the meaningful use of language comes in now at this fifth level. And at this fifth level, we want to expand that. So we do lots of pretend play and lots of back and forth chit chat with children, but everything meaningfully. If we want to teach a child a word, like open, we don't do it by looking at a picture card and memorizing the word open. We put the favorite toy of the child outside the door and say, should I open op or close the door? Open or close? And we always say the appropriate one first and the inappropriate one second so the child can't just repeat the last thing. And the child learns new words in a problem-solving manner where the child is mobilizing our old friend, their affect. Because remember, this, the words the child is learning, the symbols, in order to have meaning, have to be invested with affect or emotion. They have to have saliency for the child. So open is learn because you're opening the door to get your toy. You want to learn the difference up versus down, you're getting your toy because it's up on the shelf, or it's down there, or it's behind that, or next to that. So everything becomes learned in a problem-solving manner. So when we're doing occupational therapy exercises or speech and language exercises, we're always doing everything off of a full engagement and back and forth emotional signaling and with emotional investment. So the emotions are always investing the symbols at level five. And then the goal is to expand that. That gets us to level six, where we're combining emotionally meaningful ideas together. So the child says, go outside. And we say, why, sweetheart? Why do you want to go outside? Because I want to play. Now the child is combining ideas together. So that's what we want to see, the combination of ideas. That's, now we're getting thinking at the symbolic level. So all the W questions. Where is the truck going? Why is the truck going to the school? 
mommy to bring lunch for the children, silly. Okay, so that's part of the pretend play. So we build the W questions into the pretending. Uh, we build it into daily life. The child wants juice, juice, mommy. Okay, sweet, I'm gonna go get it. Oh, but why do you want the juice? Mommy, juice, well, because you're thirsty or because you wanna go to sleep? Go to sleep, mommy, go to sleep. Okay, let's go to sleep. No, 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 juice, juice. Well, because you're thirsty, you wanna drink it? Feel better or go sleep? Mommy, thirsty, juice now. Okay, and now the child is learning to answer why questions, learning to connect ideas together meaningfully. That's the way you teach logical thinking. And then once the child learns to connect ideas together in this way, the child begins not just connecting ideas together, connects the immediate present with the immediate future, with the immediate past, can tell you what happened at school, can begin reasoning why they feel happy. I'm happy because you gave me a hug. I'm sad because you made me wait. So they can connect up feelings together. They can connect up ideas in the past, present, and future. They can understand what's happening at school. They can understand why they have to be quiet, et cetera. So that opens up a whole new realm of development. And in fact, we see the brain uh, really mushrooming in terms of the interconnections of the different parts of the brain at, the, at this time. So these are our, our core first six stages. Now if these go well, it builds a foundation for more advanced stages of what we call functional emotional development, which I won't go into in detail because we'll be focusing on the first six, but they involve the next level, multi-causal thinking, a child giving you many reasons for something. Then it involves gray area and comparative thinking, where the child can not only tell you why they want to go outside, but how much they want to go outside. Oh, a whole lot, mommy. I really want to go out and play. Um, well, what's more fun, sweetheart, going outside and playing or playing in the basement? Oh, mommy, outside is better. Well, why? Because I can run more outside and I can do more fun things outside. So now the child is comparing things and tell you how much happier they'll be. And if that goes well, we get to the ninth level where the child can reflect on their feelings. Say, gee, mommy, I was angrier than I should be today. Or I agree with Mark Twain and disagree with Tolstoy because Twain's experiences <laughs> are similar to my own, okay? And that kind of reflective thinking where you are able to think off of a sense of self, you have a stable sense of self, and you reflect off of it, comparing how you should feel versus how you do feel, comparing Twain and Dolstoy to your own views. Uh, that thinking requires a sense of self that's evaluating the world and yourself together. That comes in typically around ages 10 through 14 in healthy development, but it builds on all the prior stages. Now once you get to that level of reflective thinking, what we call thinking off an internal sense of self, you're into the ability to say, I won't try those drugs just because my peers are, because it's not good for me. You can separate your own opinions from the group. You can form judgment. You can begin negotiating the tasks of adolescence and the later tasks of adulthood. And we try to get all the children up through level nine. And what we've seen is even children with autistic spectrum disorders, uh, a subgroup are able to get to this advanced level of high levels of creative and reflective thinking where they can make judgments. And I'll show you some videotapes tomorrow of some teenagers who've been through this program who were diagnosed with autism originally who are at this high level of reflective thinking where they're highly empathetic very self-aware, good peer relationships, et cetera. Now, it's not possible for all children. It depends a lot on how much neurologic challenge there is to begin with. But what we've seen is that all the children are capable of making progress in these stages. It's a question of how high we get. But when we help a child make progress on these critical stages, and this is the key point, all the progress is meaningful. So almost all the children become more engaged and more interactive and more purposeful and more, more towards the flow 
And as language comes in, even if it's going to be limited, it's meaningful, even if it doesn't reach the highest levels we want, them to, want it to. And that's, that's the key. So this is a very quick journey through our functional emotional developmental capacities.